Welcome. For today's Energy Central webcast entitled, Scott Madden's Energy Industry Update Webcast. Just can't get enough. A few housekeeping notes we'd like to mention. We acknowledge that given the current demand on internet connections where many are working from home, technical issues may be more pronounced. If for any reason we find the need to restart the event, we invite you to click your same link to rejoin us. If you cannot get adequate sound from your computer speakers, you may dial into the audio portion using the telephone number listed in the right-hand panel of your interface under the audio section. Following the presentation, we'll have a brief question and answer period. You may submit your questions at any time using the interface on your screen. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to our moderator, Kristen Lyons, Partner for Energy and Energy Practice Leader with Scott Madden. Kristen, welcome to the event. You have the floor. Thank you, PJ. And welcome everyone. Um, we're excited to present Just Can't Get Enough tonight, today's webinar. So like I, like PJ said, I'm Kristen Lyons. I lead Scott Madden's energy practice. And we are general management consultants specializing in energy. Within energy, we focus on the following six areas, generation, transmission and distribution, grid edge, rates and regulation, natural gas, and energy corporate services, which is work we do across corporate functions like IT, supply chain, and HR for energy companies. The content for today's webinar is largely taken from our most recent energy industry update released last month. As I said, the theme is just can't get enough which frankly applies to many aspects of the utility industry today. When you think about renewables, capital, planning, dispatchable generation, just to name a few. Our three panelists are gonna talk about the following. Um, lessons from our recent trip to Australia with SEPA, resource adequacy, and evolutions in, in system planning, integrated system planning. And with that, I'd like to introduce Kevin Hernandez. Next slide, please. Kevin joined the firm in 2012 and is a partner out of our Raleigh office. He specializes in grid transformation, energy storage, and transportation electrification. He was also one of the participants on our fact-finding mission to Australia. So Kevin, I'll turn it over to you. Great, uh, thank you, Kristen. Um, so I'd like to begin by providing, and uh, PJ, if you wanna to go to the next slide, I'd like to begin by providing a little bit of orientation to Australia's national energy market, or the NEM, as they call it. Uh, whereas Kristen mentioned, we had the opportunity to travel uh, late last year. Um, as you can see in the graphic, the, the NEM is one of the world's longest interconnected power systems. It runs in largely a north to south direction, from Queensland up in the north, that's the purple shaded um, area, uh, down south to South Australia and Victoria um, in the southwest, with a tie to the island of Tasmania. Uh, the NEM provides power to just over 10 million customers along Australia's most populated eastern coastal region, where most of the population is. Ownership and operation of the electric networks vary by state, much in the way they do in the U.S. In Victoria and South Australia, 100% um, of the, the electricity networks are privately owned. In Tasmania and Queensland, uh, it's the opposite, where the government owns those electricity networks. In New South Wales and the Australian Capital Territory, Sydney, um, it's really a, a, a mix. Uh, we have some privately owned, government owned, and some partial um, private uh, public partnerships. The Australian Energy Market Operator, or AMO, manages the market and interstate transmission development and planning. So with that context, I wanna also orient us a little bit to some of the things that are happening there. About a year ago, an event took place that, you know, really in retrospect, may have been a canary in a coal mine kind of moment for the NEM. Last June, uh, of course, it's winter um, in Australia uh, during our summertime, but last June, an extreme early season cold snap caused unprecedented surge in demand. And that demand took place at a time when a number of the coal plants were experiencing outages, which in turn, greater reliance on limited gas and, and hydro resources as well. Already high prices for gas and coal, combined with a scarcity of supply, resulted in electricity price spikes that triggered price caps, market interventions, and ultimately the entire NEM market had to be suspended. So although we could we could look at that as kind of a one in a million confluence of events, um, it, I think it did serve as a bit of a wake up call for many. And as I think you'll see as we go through the presentation, rather than the event being a one off, it really might instead be a harbinger of things to come. Next slide. 
So we'll start by talking a little bit about um, rooftop solar and distributed solar penetration and how that's changed. So like many parts of the US, Australia is in the midst of this, just a significant transformation of the electric system. And as you might imagine, it is also leading to some you know, really growing operational challenges. So as you can see in this, in this graphic here, in 2008, in the far left-hand side of the graphic, you know, only approximately 14,000 solar PV installations in the NEM, in the entire um, energy market. But if you look to the right and skip ahead to today, you can see that that figure is now approaching the three, the three million uh, system point. So pretty significant growth. Much of that has been driven by what is really just highly lucrative economics uh, to, be, to be playing, as well as very quick and a very easy interconnection process. So the excess electricity produced by rooftop solar in the NEM, it's typically sold by the consumer to their retailers for a flat feed-in tariff. And these feed-in tariffs range from about three and a half cents a kilowatt hour in Victoria to about five and a half cents per kilowatt hour in South Australia. And that's where we unsurprisingly have seen the greatest growth. Now, since the feed-in tariffs are not linked at all to the actual value of any of the excess electricity that's been generated, consumers are not incentivized in any way to time their exports for when the, the additional energy is needed by the grid. And consequently, as you might guess, the result's been a lot of constraints, uh, which have required some creative network management, system management, to limit the excess electricity exports from the rooftop solar to the grid. Next slide. So all of that's happening. At the same time, we're seeing significant and really dramatic baseload uh, generation retirements. So as you can see in the graphic here, at the same time we're seeing rooftop solar and utility scale solar and wind exploding, and you can see those in the yellow and green bars beginning in about the 2018 timeframe, we're also seeing these really significant retirements of baseload generation, primarily coal. Over the last five years, there's been those really large renewable, variable renewable resource additions. But if you look to the right-hand side of the, the slide, we really look ahead to this year in 24 and 2025, the amount of coal is being, um, that's being retired in these next few years is just dramatic. And in fact, uh, when we were there last, last November, uh, you know, we learned that this, this phase out of coal had been planned but that, that planning time frame, which was around the 10, year, 10 years or so, was, was truncated to just five. So they're really trying aggressively to, re, to reduce the amount of coal generation they have. The changes are being, being driven by two things, and these are going to sound familiar. An aging coal fleet, as well as state and national decarbonization policies, two drivers that we see here in the U.S. as well. The potential operational impacts of this really rapid transition from inertia-based generation to variable resources, as you, as you can imagine, is a primary concern of the energy market operator or the EMO. Next slide. So also last June, uh, the EMO released their 2022 Integrated System Plan or their ISP. So the, the ISP that is produced by the EMO is a whole system plan. It provides a comprehensive roadmap for the development of the NAM. And this is looking out uh, a 30 year or so time period to 2050. So in the 2022 I ISP, EMO outlined its view of what the most likely future scenarios for the NEM are gonna be. And the one that they, they decided would be the most likely is what they've called this step change scenario. And in the step change scenario, and, and it takes into account economic factors, aging generation, technical innovation, policy environment, changing customer preferences, et cetera. In the step change scenario, the EMO forecasts the combination of, of economy-wide electrification, as well as a transition to variable renewable generation, is going to drive transformational and, and they say irreversible change in the NEM. Specifically, this includes a near doubling of total energy delivered by the NEM by 2050 to 320 terawatt hours. It also calls for the retirement, or acknowledges the retirement rather, of 60% of coal capacity by 2030, the end of the decade, and nine times increase in utility scale variable resources by 2050, and an almost five times increase in distributed uh, solar PV by 2050. In addition, it calls for a 30 times increase, 30X increase in storage capacity from two gigawatt out, two gigawatts today to over 60 gigawatts um, by 2050. 
Also, what's interesting here is that not only are they calling for all of these or acknowledging all of these development of these clean energy resources, but there's also a projection for an increased amount of gas fired peaking. Um, unlike the US, there's not a, not a big build out of, of gas peaking um, uh, generation in Australia, but they're calling for an increase by 2050 of about three gigawatts from seven to 10 overall. In addition to that, the 2022 ISP acknowledges as well that a tremendous build out of the transmission system is gonna be required in order to interconnect all these resources and deliver all this utility scale renewable generation to load centers. Truly, in my opinion, a transformational change. Next slide. So as you can guess, the impacts of this transformation are gonna be pretty significant operationally. In the near term, unserved energy demands forecast remain pretty steady, with some exceptions driven by individual project timing. And that can, that's the case in New South Wales, you see on the graphic there, where there's a project driven risk near term. But beginning in 2027, 28, we begin to see forecast of reliability gaps in New South Wales, Victoria, and similar gaps appearing in Queensland and South Australia by 2029, 20, 2030. It really, by 2030, all the, United, all the Australian states within the NAM are forecast to require additional uh, capa uh, capacity additions beyond present commitments in order just to meet demand. In addition uh, to the capacity, it's also a concern that the loss of inertia-based resources in the system as well as a widespread recognition that large investments in trans transmission, as I mentioned before, are going to be required just to manage and accommodate renewable generation from an operational perspective. And next slide. So I've just just covered a lot of material. So what does it all mean? Well, you know, first it remains unclear, at least from our perspective, how Australia is going to provide firming resources to balance. You know, we're really this increasingly variable generation max. Uh, Australia has traditionally exported a lot of their natural gas and doesn't have the peaking infrastructure that we do in the US, as I mentioned. Will they be able to build that peaking capacity? Or do we think that decarbonization policies and public sentiment are going to cause them to have to find some alternative solutions? Along those lines, it's it's unclear that, or I'm sorry, it is clear that the policy has really stripped um, operational requirements outstripped operational requirements. So incentives, for instance, for distributed solar, they're exceedingly profitable for individuals. And this led, as you might imagine, to the rooftop solar penetration going going really um, you know, through the roof, uh, no pun intended, but it's not aligned with the system needs or operational considerations. At the same time, rapid retirements of baseload generation driven by the same policies and the aging plants are gonna require grid operators to develop some really some new approaches to how they're gonna manage the system. The pace of this change has also been a wake-up call for many. How will the pace of energy transformation drive costs? It, you know, it's clear to me that a, a massive amount of investment, and the EMO report, the ISP says this as well, will be needed to achieve Australia's energy goals within the timeframes uh, forecast. And I think it's an open question how they're going to manage that investment. And lastly, the role that transmission will play in interconnecting these large-scale uh, renewable resources. I don't think that could be understated. Just like in the US, NIMBYism is alive and well in Australia. Um, efforts to construct, uh, I'm sorry, to construct um, transmission, uh, connecting renewable energy zones and other large scale utility scale uh, renewables to those load centers is gonna be key to moving that power, clean power to customers. But I think it also faces some, uh, some siting challenges as well. That concludes um, my slides on Australia. So Kristen, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks very much, Kevin. And next slide, please. So our next topic is resource adequacy, and we're gonna hear from Preston Fowler. Preston is a director in our Raleigh office, and since joining Scott Madden in 2006, he has primarily worked on utility projects focused on issues like process improvement, business planning, strategy development, benchmarking, and project management. So Preston, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, next slide. Uh, please, PJ. I want to start our discussion today by taking a quick look at the existing understanding of resource adequacy and then talking about what is changing before taking a deeper dive into some of the key aspects surrounding the transition. Resource adequacy is defined as the ability of the electricity system to supply adequate electric power and energy to always meet the requirements of consumers while taking into consideration any outages uh, for system components. 
It's a longer term planning metric um, with a 10 year horizon, which allows for programs such as demand response to be instituted and new resources to be activated. Adequacy has historically been measured as the ability to meet peak demand with a margin of excess resources in the event of a large generation unit loss. This approach was developed though in an environment of large dispatchable thermal generating stations with large stocks of on-site fuels such as oil, coal, and nuclear units. However, recent events highlight the electric industry's reconsideration of its approach to resource adequacy. So what is changing? Actual, actual energy adequacy versus traditional capacity at peak? Timing and duration of events? The increase in the number of extreme weather events? And the pace and impact from changing generation portfolio? Next slide, please. Now let's take a look at how the generation portfolio of the United States has changed. In the US, renewable, hydro, and natural gas generating capacity has grown significantly in the past 25 years, from what was about a third of the total capacity in 1995 to more than two thirds in 2021. This transition away from the traditional thermal capacity has seen the rise of assets that have not historically had high capacity factors, such as gas and renewables. Even though some gas assets can to a degree handle this rise in utilization, a vulnerability does exist around fuel availability, especially during the winter months. Introduction of renewables capacity to support the transition to carbon neutrality cannot be treated the same as the capacity that it is now replacing, which impacts planning assumption and event response. Even though the chart details the renewable transition for the United States, Kevin discussed a similar impact that is being seen in Australia. Next, let's take a look at a few recent events that show the impact of weather on the grid. Next slide, please. In mid-February 2021, a polar vortex pushed down through the Midwest and into Texas, which I'm sure many of you are very aware of. While Texas occasionally experiences cold weather, those record setting, low temperatures and wind chills caused places like Dallas and Austin to remain below freezing for nearly a week. With a combination of snow, freezing rain and persistent frigid temperatures, it overwhelmed the Texas grid as both thermal and renewable resources faced equipment failures. At its worst point, more than 50 gigawatts of generation was unavailable, about 49% of the system with 100 and you know, about 108 gigawatts of installed capacity. Thermal generation made up a bulk of this unavailable resources, although some wind equipment became inoperable due to blade icing and weatherization concerns. It accounted for only about two to three gigawatts of non-performing generation. The high demand and low supply availability forced ERCOT to shed up to 20 gigawatts of load for three consecutive days, saying it was less than five minutes away from cascading grid collapse and then a months long recovery process. What made it worse is that more than 60% of Texas homes have electric space heating, which increased demand and affected the outages. This also impacted the state's natural gas production and delivery infrastructure, severely limiting the supply of the key generation field, uh, fuel across the region. Next slide, please. Winter storm Uri was not the only winter storm though to recently wreak havoc. Just six months ago, another polar vortex developed in the United States and Canada after the cold front strengthened over the Northern Plains that descended and covered much of the Eastern two thirds of the United States, bringing dangerous cold, high winds and blizzard conditions right around the Christmas holiday. Early indications are that the combination of unexpected high demand and failure of significant amount of generation to perform as expected pushed many regions into emergency operations. As a result, load shedding occurred in Tennessee and the Carolinas. While much attention has been paid to summer reliability, Winter Storm Elliott proved the grid is vulnerable to cold snaps, especially when the low temperatures are for longer periods of time and over a more widespread area, which impacted the ability to import enough power into the region. Emergency measures though, particularly through demand reduction, did help avoid some more significant and extended disruptions. 
given the coal um, that was experienced, gas production and supply was limited um, due to equipment issues. And as we know, gas and power remain interdependent on each other, and the utility industry will investigate where continued improvement and planning and processes is needed for this. This, this storm did surprise system operators and planners with the unexpected spikes in demand during a holiday weekend on what is not traditionally the coldest month of the year. Looking ahead, increased electrification will likely amplify this challenge and require more sophisticated planning. In particular, the seasonal performance of power supply will come into greater focus. In the words of NERC CEO Jim Robb, this storm underscores the increasing frequency of significant extreme weather events. It was the fifth major winter event in the past 11 years and underscores the need for the electric sector to change its planning scenarios and preparations for extreme events. Next slide, please. Although we've talked about two winter events, warm weather events are also impacting the grid, particular in particularly in places like California. In parts of August and September of 2020, California and much of the US West experienced extended temperatures in the 80s and 90s, which led to high loads across the region. Those peaks exceeded planning resource adequacy thresholds on seven days in those time periods. In mid-August, California ISO was forced to institute rotating outages at the end of the day, affecting several hundred thousand customers for extended periods of time. California ISO and the regulators analyzed this heat wave and identified three major factors contributing to the outages. First, the heat wave resulted in power demand exceeding existing resource adequacy and planning targets. Second, the transition to a reliable, clean, and affordable resource mix had outpaced the ability to effectively plan to ensure that sufficient reliable resources were available for, to meet that early evening demand. Additionally, resource availability and performance during the event were key issues. Some resources were derated because of ambient conditions, and some solar and wind resources were not available during the early evening hours when the load was curtailed. Moreover, some demand response resources did not arrive as expected. Overall, there are a few key summary thoughts related to the recent events that I want to, us to focus on. The recent multi-hour and multi-day extreme weather events have exposed planning, process, and resource gaps in power systems. A changing resource mix, especially with high solar penetration, requires more time-dependent considerations and multiple flexible options on both supply and demand. In determining resource needs, system planners must study long duration events and more extreme scenarios. They should reflect on contingencies and enhance their tabletop simulations to anticipate a wider range of risks, including common failure modes and resiliency planning. Next slide, please. So how do you deal with the need for improved resource accuracy? Well, we have to remember that for each increment in reliability, additional cost is required um, for resource procurement, maintenance, especially for systems with high renewable penetration that have those elevated redundancy requirements. While systems could procure all this adequacy within their footprint, some are employing resource pooling arrangements. One such arrangement is the Western Resource Adequacy Program, which is the first regional reliability planning and compliance program in the history of the West. Its goal is to deliver a region-wide approach to resource adequacy, providing coordination, visibility across participants, and encouraging the use of regional resource diversity compared to the status quo of producing your own. In its FERC application, RAP denoted that it comprised of 26 entities across 10 states and one Canadian province. The program is voluntary and uses the West existing bilateral market structure to conduct regional resource planning, and that is comprised of two main components. The forward showing, which is that RAP sets a regional reliability metric and a, and a consistent approach for counting of resources, and then operational, which is this 
component allows for participants to pool and share resources during tight grid operating conditions. This pooling and transfer approach relies on, upon deliverability of the resources to the system in need. So just like Kevin talked about, adequate transmission capacity between regions is critical. RAP includes an analysis of the transmission capabilities and availability, and each participant has a forward showing requirement for that transmission service. And then additionally, external resources must be available. This could be problematic with wide area events affect nearby regions and during emergency conditions may require system operators to limit exports as was seen during winter storm Elliott. Next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, changes in characteristics of supply and demand have increased the variability and resource adequacy. Historically, probabilities of reliability events due to forced mechanical outages were assumed to be independent from other variables such as weather. However, renewables, especially re variable renewables, are subject to weather such as wind availability, solar irradiance, and ice accumulation on wind, wind turbine blades. As we transition and gas turbine assets become key dispatchable resources, their performance becomes even more impacted by weather due to the effects of fuel availability, D rates due to high temperatures, and the potential for frozen equipment during winter storms. Additionally, recent climate trends necessitate rethinking whether to rely on historical data for probabilistic analysis and new hybrid technologies such as solar and storage and then longer duration storage assets have unique operating characteristics that don't fit neatly into the traditional way of resource analysis. So what, what are people doing? Well, one group is trying to address these issues is the Energy Systems Integration Group, which has proposed these six principles for modernizing the approach to resource adequacy analysis. The first is quantifying the size, frequency, and duration and timing of shortfalls. Then moving on, they talk about modeling chronological operations across many weather years versus the typical approach, and accept that there is no such thing as perfect capacity. So it takes into account things that can go wrong. And then understanding that load participation farm fundamentally changes that construct. And then modeling neighboring grids and transmission as resources is something that has not typically been done within the industry, but given the fact of the dependence upon the national grid, it is something that needs to be considered moving forward. And then the idea of making reliability criteria transparent to everybody that is involved, including the economic costs of increased reliability. Next slide, please. There are, there are other actions that could impact resource adequacy moving forward as well. The system operators and regulatory bodies have some actions to update the approach. Texas legislature is considering proposals about incentivizing gas plant builds. NERC has issued a winter preparation alert um, as a result of recent winter weather, um, defining the capacity accreditation for all resource types, and then some seasonal analysis improvements. A few other things to consider are, there's the chance for permitting reform, uh, increased inter-regional transfer capacity, and then finally, the EPA's recent proposed emissions rules. Next slide, please. Finally, to wrap everything up, there are a few key takeaways I want everyone to focus on. Planning conditions are in constant flux, rapidly growing, and more variable demand with the electrification of everything, two-way grid resources, and less dispatchability, among other things. There are more long duration, extreme weather events affecting supply demand that occur on months that are not traditional. And then traditional measures of adequacy worked well in the past, but given the resource mix change with more energy limited resources, coming online and the increased number of hours of insufficiency, likely during non-peak hours and shoulder months. With this increased complexity, utilities must re-examine all their tools, models, planning criteria, the assumptions, 
and the processes themselves to accommodate this evolving supply, demand, and environmental dynamics. As you can see, the methods for planning will need to change to support the new energy future. Thank you for your time today, and I'd like to turn it back over to Kristen. Thank you, Preston. And that's a perfect transition to the discussion of integrated system planning. Um, as Preston talked about, we're seeing tremendous change in how we start to plan the supply side of the business. And what we're seeing is integrated system planning across transmission distribution and generation is changing as the industry evolves. So on this topic, we're gonna to hear from Stephen Hobrick. Stephen is a director affiliated with our Atlanta office. He joined the firm in 2011, and he's worked with a variety of utilities over the years, specializing in electric transmission and distribution, capital project planning, operational process improvement, and project management. Stephen? Thank you, Kristen. And it's a pleasure to speak to you all today about integrated system planning. Next slide, please. Before I jump in, I thought what I might do is provide a little overview of how we'll approach this. You know, first off, we want to start by providing a little context that will be helpful for understanding integrated system planning, uh, provide a description of what integrated system planning is, talk about some of the objectives, uh, who all is engaging right now in integrated system planning or looking at it, and talk about how get, what role gas has in all of this. So thinking about the context, uh, why is the industry talking about integrated system planning? Well, uh, Kevin and Preston just really talked about this in, in depth. It's the, the complexity of operating the grid today has never been higher and it's only expected to increase. Uh, these complexities are primarily driven by net zero targets in the, tra the energy transition. So uh, the, these complexities, these change factors are driving changes to the planning processes uh, changing, driving changes rather within each of the planning processes, generation, transmission, and distribution. So to start off with generation, just to take a look at a couple of, of items, uh, the factors that are driving change and complexity, the first one you see is resource intermittency. And so that's something that uh, both Kevin and Preston have been talking about, and it's the fact that you have so much more intermittent renewables, solar and wind, that the, that the generators cannot directly control. And so you have uh, instability in the, the, the generation supply. And so that requires more ramping capability. So the ability to, to run other assets to even out the power uh, supply and match it to demand. In some regions also, there are issues with gas availability, especially during certain seasons for generation, further complicating things. So all of these factors are, and others are leading to complexities within generation planning. And then if you take transmission, for example, uh, just interconnecting all the renewables is a challenge. Uh, extreme weather events are, are causing issues for transmission infrastructure in the field. And the installation of demand side resources are at times causing backflows of power into transmission assets. The distribution, what we're all familiar with is the, the proliferation of distributed energy resources onto the grid creating complexity and two-way power flows and more inverter-based generation on the system. Also, electrification um, is, a, is a big topic right now because it's uh, impacting loads and load profiles and only expected to increase dramatically. And then maybe one other thing to point out for distribution would be that stakeholders are involved more today in the distribution planning processes than ever before. So uh, next slide, please. In addition to change factors that are driving changes in complexity within each planning process, there are also importantly factors that are driving change between the planning processes. Um, some examples of this would be between generation and transmission, you have interconnection queue challenges, right? The time it takes to, and the, and the process it takes to uh, do the, the system studies and to be able to interconnect assets between generation and transmission. You have the FERC NOPER from last year on transmission regional planning and cost allocation, which is, is inextricably, 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 excuse me, links generation and transmissions because for the FERC NOPER requires transmission planning to go further, it's going to require, it's proposed this time, to require planning to go at least 20 years out and to use scenario-based analysis. 
And so that means that you have to better understand your generation mix and the impacts of your transmission to adequately uh, make do that planning, and that requires coordination. And then also adding complexity between these two is resources that span these two functions. And so a good example of that would be battery storage. Battery storage could be a generation asset or also could be a transmission asset providing voltage support and supporting system inertia where you have high amounts of inverter-based generation. Another area of interaction between two areas is transmission and distribution. And so between transmission and distribution, you see aggregation of DERs and demand response that are now able to participate in the wholesale markets. You also see distributed energy resources that are coming on to the system at sub-transmission level. And this is creating complexity that's causing both the distribution and transmission to have to look at these new assets and understand the system, the impacts of the system essentially. And, um, and then again, optimizing solutions across T&D. So today there's a need more than ever to look at potential uh, the solutions to system violations or system constraints and really look at them across assets to identify the best ones, the best solutions for the system. Next slide, please. So with that background, and that really answers why we're looking at this and what we heard from Kevin and Preston really reinforces the complexity. Um, what is integrated system planning? And this is where we have to break the bad news that there really is no one common industry definition that everyone's aligned around. It's, it's a relatively early times in discussion. A lot of different groups are looking at this from utilities to regulators. But at the end of the day, there's a core principle between all of these. And that is that integrated system planning or these various efforts are all looking to increase the amount of coordination between the various planning groups that may currently be siloed or operating largely independently. And all of that in the name of and for the purpose of addressing the complexity that we've, that we've been talking about most of the call today. Maybe I'll point out also here, if you look at uh, the number of different terms or names that, that you'll see for uh, integrated system planning, one I would point out on the left-hand side, the comprehensive, comprehensive electricity planning that is one that Nehruk and Naseo used for this same concept when they studied it. Uh, they looked at this concept of integrating system planning back in 2018, and they studied it for two years. And I think one of the key points that really would be a, a, an important takeaway here is that after looking at it for two years, what they determined is that you know they didn't come out and say, here's what comprehensive electricity planning or here's what integration looks like and what we should all do. Instead, what they said is what integrated system planning looks like or what this collaboration looks like depends very much on what assets a utility owns, whether they're vertically integrated or they're a wires utility, whether or not they participate in an organized market, and also the public policy that impacts them in their particular region. And so what they did was they created basically a group of what they call cohorts or different scenarios uh, that different utilities might find themselves in and provide some guidance on how to think about integrated system planning. So I think that just really illustrates that there's no one common definition, but there are ways to think about how to approach it based on an individual utility situation. Next slide, please. So what are utilities trying to achieve through integrated system planning? I think we talked about a little bit of this, but number one, better management of increasing penetrations of DERs. Uh, distributed energy resources bring a lot of complexity and they're an important part of the energy transition. So this is about, part of this is about managing those impacts. Number two, achievement of aggressive net zero carbon emission reduction targets. We really talked about that up front as one of the key drivers of why, what's number one was creating the complexity and number two, why utilities are looking at integrated system planning to better manage those complexities, better understand them and manage them. Number three, optimization of investments at the system level. This is one we haven't touched on too much yet, but it's, I think I touched on a little bit earlier, is that the instead of planning, instead of uh, basically identifying solutions to system constraints within generation or within transmission, within distribution, 
and maybe largely implementing that solution based on what works best within that asset category. Integrated system planning facilitates the conversation and the coordination between these planning functions so they can look at and consider what might be the best solution for system constraints, not just for uh, each asset category, not just for the system as it is, exists today, but also as the, we expect the system to be tomorrow. And I know this was discussed earlier too, but you know, it's really, there's an expectation there's gonna be a significant change or someone said a step change in what the system will look like in the future. So this is about optimizing the investments for that future system. And maybe I'll cover the last two together. Um, this is really about shifting from uh, deterministic to probabilistic forecasting. And deterministic forecasting, of course, being forecasting based on your historicals. And as I was just mentioning, if we truly expect a step change or a significant change in what the future is going to look like, it doesn't make as much sense as it might have been in the past to use our historical data to plan the system to. So what we might want to do is look at the, build some scenarios for what the future might look like, perhaps select a set of those scenarios, and then plan a system to be equipped to meet what those scenarios of the future might look like. And since none of us have a crystal ball, it's difficult to pick one scenario and plan to that one scenario, but it's it's much easier to plan to multiple scenarios or much more likely that if we plan to multiple scenarios, that one of those might best represent the future and the, the system is prepared for those futures. Next slide, please. So who's looking at integrated system planning? Uh, on the slide here, you'll see that there are a number of utilities that we've called out, SRP, Salt River Project, HECO, Excel, and Duke. And these are all examples of utilities that have made some public statement about integrated system planning, some of the changes that they're making. And these represent different drivers. Some of these utilities are pursuing integrated system planning simply because they've recognized the commit the complexity and they see it as necessary to reach their net zero commitments. Others have might have a regulatory uh, commitment to better integrate their planning processes, but either way, they're they're all making step visible steps to integrate planning. In addition to some of these really salient examples, we are also talking to a lot of our clients about integrated system planning. And what we're discovering is that most of our clients that we're talking to are thinking about integrated system planning. So whether or not they're calling it integrated system planning, as we're talking to them, they are think they're recognizing the complexity and they're thinking about how to prepare themselves to better manage that complexity and how they can better coordinate in the future and in a lot of cases maybe formalize some of the existing ad hoc processes today. So as part of that, we are currently conducting a benchmark study on integrated system planning with a set of utilities that really represent regions across the country. They represent vertically integrated utilities. They represent wires utilities, ones operating in and outside of markets. Uh, the variety of different operating circumstances that we talked about were modeled in the um, Nehruk Neseo study. So it's going to help us understand, better understand this and be able to um, help our clients better with these, uh, with integrated system planning. We're looking forward to preparing that report here in the next few weeks, maybe early July. Next slide, please. So how does gas fit into this discussion? and is gas impacted? And the short answer is yes, gas is impacted and gas is a part of this discussion. Maybe the, the two key factors that are really driving change for the gas planning and the gas business is electrification and non-pipes solutions. If we take non-pipe solutions first. Um, non-pipe solutions are driving a change for gas planning to have to become more granular, especially gas forecasting. In order to be able to evaluate non-pipe solutions, the gas forecasting process and planning process will have to become more granular, and that's going to represent a change for the gas planning uh, business. The other change is electrification, and you know, as we are, especially as we're talking about clean heat and the transition from natural gas to electric heating, and so this is going to potentially change loads dramatically um, for both gas and electric. And one thing that's important here is that for utilities that own both gas and electric, and particularly 
where they have overlapping service territories, they're really going to need to think about coordination between gas and electric planning to under, make sure that their assumptions are aligned and that if in one part of the business they see a particular rate of decline, that they're ready to meet that demand on the other side of the business. Next slide, please. So for key takeaways, uh, I think these are really just driving home the points that uh, we have been talking about throughout, but complexity is changing. Complexity is increasing and the rate of that complexity and the degree of that complexity is only expected to accelerate. Um, number two is that utilities are actively thinking about these things, they're actively investigating increased coordination and collaboration, and in essence, looking at integrated system planning. And lastly, it's just that gas is also impacted. It's not just electric, uh, gas is impacted and gas will have an important role in, in the future for also coordinating with both gas, between gas and electric planning. So that's, uh, that's all that I had to cover here. And I'll turn it back over to you, Kristen. Thanks very much, Stephen. And if my panelists could also join me on screen, we're gonna take a, a few questions. We have a few minutes um, before the end of the, end of our allotted time here. So thank you, each of you. Um, I've got a list of questions that have come in, um, and I, I want to start with one. We were asked about the ISP benchmarking study. So we're going to release a summary um, of that, as Stephen said, in July. Uh, if anyone is interested in participating in that study, please reach out to me. My contact information is available on the website. Um, so first up, Kevin, um, we got a question about nuclear in Australia. And they said, did there seem to be any appetite in Australia for nuclear given the amount of carbon emitting baseload energy that will be retiring? With a reminder to those that aren't aware, um, nuclear is currently banned in Australia. So Kevin, you wanna take that one? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. It's a, it's a great question, I'm glad it was asked. Um, um, we asked the question, the same question when we were there meeting with a number of the Australian energy officials that we that we had meetings with, and it was a um, the official party line is it's a hard no. Um, nuclear is, as Chris mentioned, there's been a ban for quite some time, and um, it is not on the table um, even for discussion. So that was uh, a bit of a surprise to me. Uh, I would think that they would want um, to consider all all types of generation, particularly non-carbon emitting generation, but um, they have a pretty firm stance there. No question. Um, so we got one question, question about, it's actually closer to the transmission world than it is to um, the generation side. So interconnecting RTOs and the east-west interconnections would go a long way to getting us through these extreme weather events. How close are we to moving toward an intercontinental transmission network? And having worked in transmission for more than 20 years, I would say we are very far away from an intercontinental transmission network. The good news in this story is that many stakeholders are realizing how valuable transmission is. And actually you can't get to a clean energy future without transmission to connect and re connect renewables. We're also seeing more and more evidence of um, the role that transmission can play in managing resilience through the kinds of events that Preston talked about. So uh, long story short, we are not there. I think we're a long way given the challenges in siting and permitting. FERC is clearly very aware of the need to adjust planning and cost allocation processes um, and is taking action there. So there's hope on the horizon, but I don't think we're looking at any major changes in terms of what's built within the next 10 years or more. Um, unfortunate though that is. So a question for um, Preston. Mm -hmm. So you note a lot of activity by industry stakeholders regarding resource adequacy. Is there anything going on at FERC on this topic? I, you know, that's a good question. Actually, there is. The commissioners have been increasingly vocal about resource adequacy and more broadly reliability itself. Um, Commissioner Christie has said that the resource problem generally is not the addition of intermittent resources, primarily wind and solar, but the far too rapid subtraction of the dispatchable resources, especially coal and gas. Um, you know, and then further, you know, Commissioner Clements has pointed, you know, to multiple tools in the toolbox, right, to re to solve the RA. Um, problems um, and the commission activities in enhancing that toolbox include right now really long range transmission planning, something you were talking about, right? And um, 
interconnection key reform and extreme weather preparation. Um, and then finally, Chair Phillips has said that the staff is working as quick as they can to finalize those key transmission related rulemakings intended to address pieces of the puzzle. So rather than a comprehensive RA docket to follow everything, its initial kind of technical conference in March 2021, FERC appears to be addressing this issue through separate but related initiatives. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, so question for Kevin, um, to what degree has public demand for clean energy resources driven the adoption of rooftop solar and renewables um, across the, the NEM? Yeah, so so clearly there's been some interest in in driving some of the the state and um, national policies around this, but less than you would expect. In fact, the growth of rooftop solar, and, and as I discussed, particularly in South Australia, uh, is driven by those feed-in tariffs and really the attractive economics. In fact, we talked to some folks there that said, you know, it's so easy to interconnect solar. And it's just a guaranteed, you know, high solar radiation, and it's just almost a guaranteed income stream that um, many, many people are putting solar PV on their roofs, independent of their feelings um, or beliefs about clean energy. So it's moving the needle a little bit in terms of clean energy policies at a, a national level, but a lot of the people that are putting solar PV on their roofs are doing it for the money. Yep. Yeah, very lucrative feed-in tariffs. Thank you for that. Um, so, Stephen, as you think about what we're seeing in terms of how you, utilities are approaching integrated system planning, what are some of the things that, well, are similar across utilities or different? You know, I think that um, what we see for sure is that you know, utilities are, are definitely thinking about this, number one, right? So as we're talking to folks, we're definitely seeing that um, our, our clients are, and, and the utilities that we're speaking with, are thinking about integrated system planning and they are beginning to take steps to better understand what they would need to do to integrate their planning processes. And so some of the things that they're looking at is like we talked about, changing from more deterministic to more probabilistic forecasting. And they're starting to look at their processes. So uh, to the degree to which maybe they are um, coordinating on an ad hoc basis today, but maybe there are opportunities to formalize those coordination points and in particular, it, as it relates to evaluating various potential projects and really thinking about, okay, we've got a project, we've got a constraint here, we could have a generation solution or a transmission solution, but and either would work now, but which one's the best one for the long-term health of the system and where the system is heading? And, um, and then maybe lastly would just be organizationally. Do we need to make some changes to bring some of these groups together to better facilitate um, integrated system planning? Thank you for that. Um, so Preston, when you think about the challenges that we face on resource adequacy, what would you describe as an underappreciated issue that we're facing? I, I, I think one of the biggest one is that interdependence of gas in the power system. It, and it just continues to be an issue, right? So particularly when you're looking at winter system performance. Um, when we talk about planning, you know, they assume other than historical trending of forced outages, right? So it's it should be available no matter what, right? It's available when you demand it, unless it's in a forced outage. You know, however, as that demand increases because of the electrification, so especially in winter, um, that demand for gas and power grows um, and it will need to do so to to also support renewable penetration right and expanding that gas infrastructure faces challenges in many places especially the northeast right um, and those units may then become less of a sure thing it's 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 that dependence upon the gas supply itself yeah absolutely and and we actually have gotten a question on isn't renewables only driving us to be more dependent on natural gas well i think what we're seeing is that it's this evolution of the roles that different resources are starting to play in the supply mix you know we we've seen a lot of natural gas come on the system particularly in markets because it was cheap people was retiring and it supported decarbonization actually um so I don't know that it's renewables driving us to be more dependent upon gas, but but gas plays a role in making sure that that capacity is firmed up. Um, so yeah, it's I think as this entire 
supply mix changes, the things that we need to watch, as you talked about, in terms of resource adequacy, watching for um, energy versus capacity, peak sure. versus the shoulder months, those kinds of challenges are going to look really different. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit more about how transmission can support resource adequacy? Again, we're hearing so much about that right now out of FERC. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, much of that discussion of resource focus, focuses on the resources within a planning footprint. But as you know, you're starting to see increased interest, especially when you see things like the winter storm Elliot, where there was a lot, it was widespread and they were having to, you know, share power across with, you know, um, emergency authorizations. Um, there's a discussion new for the new approaches and its ability to model resources in nearby regions, right? So you have to understand, so if you're in a certain region and you're modeling your own, you need to be able to say, okay, well, if I'm dependent upon the market for some of what power I may need, I need to understand what theirs looks like. Um, and it's enhancing that trans, you know, enhancing the understanding of that and then identifying where you may need to enhance that transfer capability um, to enable those reserves when needed. Thank you for that. So in, as we think about Australia and, you know, I, my words, not yours, Kevin, the ghost of Christmas future for the U.S., didn't the Australians foresee what would happen by suddenly accelerating the retirement of so much baseload generation? <laughs> I mean, that's a, it's a tricky question. I mean, I would say that there were some that were warning, you know, clearly Emo and, and others were warning about some of the potential challenges that um, that would create. But I think, you know, in the end, uh, the policymakers made the decision to to establish a policy and move, you know, pretty rapidly um, towards a, kind of that clean energy transition, and to kind of let industry figure out how to how to make it happen. Um, if we have to remember also, in the years preceding the, the Australian energy law, uh, there was a lot of there wasn't much political support for clean energy. Um, Australia is a, you know, a lot of mining and a lot of um, natural resource production there. Um, so this really was a pretty quick uh, reversal of policy and it came about pretty rapidly. Um, but I think, you know, the takeaway I think for us is that this is very clearly an example of what happens when policy is made and that policy, um, you know, the, the operational folks are maybe not in the room or not part of that discussion and, you know, policy really drives the agenda. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think for those of you who are interested, there are some great case studies about, you um, South Australia particularly, and the management of that grid, even under islanded conditions with significant penetrations of rooftop solar. So again, as we think about the ghost of Christmas future, there are some lessons learned that are coming out of there that are very interesting. Um, so we are just at the top of the hour, and I'm going to turn it back over to PJ. So thank you very much to our panelists. I really appreciate the time you put into this. PJ, um, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you, speakers. Fantastic presentation. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed today's discussion. Please make, take note that we put a link to the EIU right there on your screen and also in your chat. We invite you to download it and learn more. As you log off, please also take a minute to fill out our survey. Give us your feedback so we can continue to provide you with quality content. Thank you so much for attending, and this does conclude today's presentation.